Hello, and welcome to Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Torella. And I'm your better, prettier, younger host, Tori. We're sisters who are obsessed with true crime and love gal palin with you about cases. You can expect the occasional curse word, lots of friends quotes, and all the 90s nostalgia. To get in on the conversation, check us out at KillerQueensPodcast.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook at Killer Queens Podcast, and we're on YouTube at Killer Queens, a true crime podcast. Okay, y'all, grab your Capri Suns or your Surge, and let's talk about some true crime. All right, you guys, part two, Maura Murray. Yes, and I just wanted to remind people of the trigger warnings that we have in case you started here. I Good plan. I don't know if that's something that people do, but maybe, you know, Um, but we're going to be talking about drinking and driving and possible murder. So, yes, good plan. And thanks to Madison again for writing this one up for us. And should we thank the people that requested it again? Yes, let's do that. Why not? Thanks to Cheyenne Orr, Danielle Paisby, Sullivan Norris, Jordan Smith Youngblood, Charlotte B., Samantha Dorenzo, Danielle Groff, Joni Portwood, Brady Rose Clark, Samantha, and Laura Smith Haverly. And um, if you want to submit a case, just I'm going to find the link so that I don't mess it up. But um, we do have a form on our website, and it is killerqueenspodcast.com slash case submission. And that's where you can request a case. And we did get a message the other day. Somebody was like, hey, how long does it usually take to get your case covered? We have like 2,000 on the list. So it might be a while. Mm-hmm. It just kind of depends on like a few different things. Like, you know, if cases start getting like a lot of requests, you know, that kind of flags the writers to look at it and stuff like that. So and just whatever they want to write about, essentially. But um, we will certainly try to get to them all. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Should we um, kind of give a where we left off? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So we are at the scene of the accident for Mora. She has left her college, UMass. She told her professor that there was a death in the family, which was untrue. She told a friend that she had a family emergency, something regarding her sister. She drives to... Vermont? Well, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah, she's in New Hampshire when she crashes, but... Yes. Haverhill, Haverhill. I don't know how to say it. New Hampshire. And she crashes around this really, 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 really sharp curve. And some people have seen the... I don't know if they saw the accident, but they saw the aftermath of it. Mm -hmm. And so they call the police. The police have been notified, but Mara is completely gone. Nobody knows where she went. Uh, Maine. Mm -hmm. Just wild. Wild and crazy stuff. I know. Okay, really quickly, before we get into today's case, we want to let you know about everything we're dropping on the Patreon, just in case you're interested in these cases. Patreon is our kind of membership area where you get bonus episodes for joining and you get to support the show if you would like to do so financially. Tomorrow, we drop our murder mixtape and we are covering the attempted murder of Melissa Dome. You're welcome, Steve. The oh, Yes, the fact that she survived. It's, it's an amazing survival story. It is amazing. And it has like this super fairy tale twist at the end that's like incredible and makes me cry thinking about it. I know. It's so sweet. It Ugh. is. It's so sweet. It's also horrific. I mean, it, it's all the things, yes, you know. Yes, for sure. Yes. And then Friday, we have our Doc Jams that release. And that is our weekly coverage of docu-series that either are requested or we just have loved to watch. Mm-hmm. So this week is the first episode of Tinder Swindler. So if you watch Tinder Swindler on Netflix, it's a one-part kind of documentary. It's not a docu-series. But we've broken it up into two because it is very long and we want to talk long. about it more. Yeah, exactly. Yes. We have to talk about like all the things. Yes. So. Tinder Swindler, it details the story of a group of women who were the victims of a dating app-based swindler, and they joined together in an attempt to hunt him down and recover the millions, millions of dollars that were stolen from them. You guys. And I know, like, people Mm -hmm. have so many opinions about this, like how they feel about the women, and, you know, a lot of people are like, "Uh, well, they're stupid. I would never give somebody that much money. But 
I don't know. I mean, he's he's good at what he does, man, and he's still doing it. So mm-hmm. that's the thing that sucks about people like this that con people. They don't serve very much jail time, and they get right back out and go right back to it. And it's just like, well, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. And possibly during their jail stints, get even better at what they're doing. So Exactly. And of course, on Sunday, we drop our weekly catch-up episode, uh, T to the fourth power Y, some time to talk to you. And when you shorten it all up, it looks like titty. So Titty. Yep. So we're doing uh, come hang out on the titty. And we talk about just like random stuff. Literally everything. Yeah. So, but that's your kind of like glimpse into you because we ha- we've had people ask for like personal updates. So that's kind of where we give those. We don't include those in the main feed because we know that um, most people want to the true crime. Yeah. So yeah. that's where we cover those things. So go to patreon.com slash killer queens pod to join in on the fun. And you can also join our email list, which we actually have really great reviews on. Um, our emails are actually the bomb. We don't do them. Our friend Megan does. She's an amazing job. But you can go to killerqueens.link slash email. You can be the uh, first to know about fun happenings. We list all the cases that we cover there. We do 90s throwbacks there. All kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get to the case. All right. So I love the title of this section of the script. Madison mm-hmm. titled it A Whole Lot of What the Fuck. <laughs> and I, I, I concur. I approve. At 7.54, Sergeant Smith put out a bolo for a female on foot who was about 5'7". Julie found this odd as it was her sister's exact height, though the only person to truly see her up close was Atwood, and he'd been in the seat of a school bus. And he also said that when he was shown her picture that— It didn't look like her. Right. And they were like, but I know everything about her. Yeah. I don't know. But, I mean, at that point, could they have gotten, like, information from— like her driver's license when they find out who the car was registered to. Yeah, I don't... I mean, is it that weird? I don't know. Because if they got her exact height, then it seems like you'd be getting that from, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Around the same time, fire and EMS were sent out to help on scene. They ended up only being on scene for about 10 minutes because there were no patients to be found. State Trooper John Monahan? Mongahan? I don't know. Heard the radio traffic and stopped to help with the search for the driver. Unfortunately, nobody was located and nobody reported seeing anyone walking in the area. That is what is so crazy. Mm -hmm. It's snowing outside. Like There would be tracks. There would be tracks. And like, especially in the middle of nowhere, you would take notice of being like, there's somebody walking out there, you know? Well, and this is at night in February. Yeah. In New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's cold. Mm -hmm. Real damn cold. Mm -hmm. I'm a little on the dramatic side. The other day it was like 50 degrees and I was really cold. So when I walked the dogs, I put my snow bib on. (laughs) Because it was windy. It was very windy though. Yeah, see? No, I don't blame you. But it's this time of year when we get like a little bit of warmth just enough to tease us and then it goes back to like kind of chilly I my body has already adjusted to the warmth Mm -hmm. so I'm like "Uh -uh, mm -mm, I'm Mm -hmm. freezing yep exactly same Mm -hmm. yeah and I was like I don't care who sees it I'm wearing a coat and a bib get over it (laughs) but then it's crazy because you see people walking around in shorts Shorts. (laughs) yeah and I feel really stupid yeah Yeah. before 9 p.m the scene was cleared with the vehicle being towed by Lavoy towing it to a lot at his house Sergeant Smith, in his accident report, said that when he arrived on scene, he found evidence that suggested the vehicle had been traveling westbound, went off the roadway, struck some trees, and spun around, ultimately facing the wrong direction. The vehicle had damage that seemed to be mainly on the front left corner. He said that in plain sight, he was able to see a box of Franzia was behind the driver's seat, along with red liquid spilled on the driver's side door and ceiling. How did it get on the ceiling? Maybe in the crash? But you do a roll. roll. Okay. And I've seen commercials where that exactly happens. Mm -hmm. And then it's like. Yeah, it always happens on the. Some bounty. uh Uh-huh. Yeah. The infomercials. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess in my mind, I'm thinking that's in a cup, but they don't mention a cup. No, it's just the box. drinking it out of the box. Well, have you, are you going to sit here and tell me you've never slapped a bag of wine? Mm -mm. we've had it poured right inside of our mouths. I remember one specific party that we went to. I did too. One specific friend, yes, that did it. 
Oh, well, I don't remember it. So I guess that's how that night went. <laughs> you didn't remember it. So it never happened. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're, I mean, you wouldn't be able to do that while you're driving. Oh, Lord, no, I don't, I don't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, how did it? I don't know. Whatever. He did say that he found a Coke bottle that had a red liquid in it that had a strong alcoholic odor to it. So maybe she was pouring it in the Coke bottle. Maybe. It's just very strange that she would start drinking when she's driving at night in the snow in an area that she's unfamiliar with. Like, Mm -hmm. because as far as we know, she didn't have like a drinking problem. Right. I mean, she crashed Fred's car when she was drunk, but I mean, she was in college and went to a dorm party. Like, who didn't get drunk, you know, then? Right. I wonder if the reason why she's in an area that she's unfamiliar with is maybe she was drunk and just, you know, got lost. It's possible. Because this would have been MapQuest days. Yes. You would have to print that shit out. Stop and ask someone. Yeah. The directions phase. Yeah. Yeah. Then you miss a turn when you're going somewhere on MapQuest. Screwed. Yeah, there's no voice that's like recalculating. Recalculating. <laughs> yeah. It's like, nope, that's, um, you got to figure out where you, now you got to get on a map. Mm-hmm. An atlas, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yep. The car had nearly a full tank of gas and both front airbags were deployed. There was a spidering of the windshield on the top left corner. It was later determined that at the time of the collision, the driver had their high beams on and was not wearing a seatbelt. Due to this being an older vehicle, they were unable to determine if someone was sitting in the passenger seat. Mara had a lot of personal belongings in her car. These included, but were not limited to, clothing, makeup, Tic Tacs, school books, Vermont Attractions Guide, an open jar of baby dill pickles. Right on board there. Uh I love a baby dill pickle. I do too. And I have many times eaten that shit in the car because I couldn't (laughs) wait till I got home. Well, you have been known to have a lot of snacking, like olives. Yep. I like to eat olives in the car. Uh, The other, yesterday I had carrots, baby carrots in the car. Oh, that's really sweet. They're cute. I never eat in my car unless I'm like, really? Like if I have, well, I don't, I don't carry snacks with me in the car, but like if I'm going to an appointment and I, it's like, let's say it's at noon and I'm like, uh-uh, I'm going to have to eat before that because I cannot wait. So I'll just like get something before and then eat it in the car like that. But I don't just like carry around a jar of pickles. T- I should. You should. Yeah. You're a star of would. pickled okra. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. An open bottle of Diet Cherry Coke, an opened package of strawberry Twizzlers, which she reportedly used as straws to drink her soda out of. And she is on it. Mm-hmm. She don't fuck around. You know, there are people that like, I mean, I don't know. I guess I have like little quirks like that, you know, where I'm like, I still do this, even though it makes me seem like a child, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. But she's just like, it's good and I like it. <laughs> exactly. I've done it before. You have? And it's, yeah, it's not bad. I'm not a huge Twizzlers fan. I just don't like sweets in that way, kind yeah. of. But I will tell you this. If there is a pixie stick or a fun dip in mm-hmm. the vicinity, I'll yeah. take it. Oh, yeah. Oh, Drink yeah. Sugar. Mm-hmm. There was shampoo, a pack of birth control with four pills missing, a copy of the book Not Without Peril, 150 Years of Misadventure on the Presidential Range of New Hampshire, wow. nail polish, sleeping pills, lotion, toothpaste, and deodorant, plus many other things that didn't seem too out of the ordinary for a female college student to have. There was also a three-by-five note card with written directions to Burlington, Vermont. In the tailpipe of the vehicle, police found a rag stepped inside. And her father later explained this, saying that Mara's Saturn was on its last leg and had lost a cylinder. Fred said smoke would pour out of it, and she shouldn't really be driving it. But if she had to, if she needed to get by police without black smoke coming from the tailpipe, she could stuff a rag into it. The tailpipe? Yeah, I was hoping you wouldn't notice that. (laughs) I notice everything that you do wrong. (laughs) The tailpipe, yes. (laughs) <laughs> That's right next to the phalange, in case you didn't know. The left or right phalange? The left, of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows the right phalange isn't even a thing. <laughs> they only have one, and it's specifically called the left phalange, yeah. but there is no right phalange. The right side doesn't need a phalange. Wouldn't it just be the phalange, then? That's where the tailpipe goes. Okay. I just I didn't realize how much I don't know about cars. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank God you're here. We have a car expert. I know. You'd be, you'd sound like an idiot. (laughs) 
The funny thing is your husband is a car expert. So yeah, that's true. And I know nothing about them, but Fred didn't want her to get a ticket for excessive smoke coming from her vehicle. So stuff the rag in there and he was about to get her a new car anyway. So yeah, whatever. Once it was determined who the vehicle belonged to, Fred was notified of the accident and that his daughter was nowhere to be found. When he learned that Mora was missing, it was already 24 hours after the accident. Well, okay, so that kind of blows out of the water that what I was thinking a minute ago, which was like about, yeah, how did they know her height? Because they would have found out who, if it took them that long to figure out who the car was registered to. Yeah. And it's probably registered to Fred, not Mora. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that just totally ruined everything you just said. Yep. Mm hmm. I cannot imagine. And of course, I'm sure that Fred's first thought, if they're like, we can't find her, is, oh my God, what happened? But could you imagine? I mean, this is like the second accident that she's been in, in like two days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you get a call and they're like, your daughter's been in an accident. He's like, are you fucking kidding me? And then he's like, we can't find her. Mm -hmm. But I feel like you would also be like, okay, well, maybe she got a ride with a friend, you know, like, yeah. She'll call me as soon as she gets somewhere where she can call me. Mm-hmm. And then literally 18 years later, you still don't know where she is. It's so terrifying. Heart-wrenching, yeah. The initial search for Mara didn't yield anything. There were no signs of foul play and no footprints leading into the woods beside the ditch. Her cell phone, wallet, and keys were not found. It is believed that officers only searched west of the accident site. And Fred was understandably upset by this, believing that Mara had been heading east, likely to Bartlett an area that they used to frequent during hiking and camping trips. So she, if she knew which direction, and Mara's Mara's a smart little cookie. Mm -hmm. She knows the east and west and stuff. Yeah, I would not. Mm -mm, No. But I'm guessing that she would. And she could, yeah. I don't understand if they investigate it, why they didn't investigate it, but. Yeah. Why they were so set on, she had to be going west instead of east, but. Yeah, because like, just because the car they believed that the car was traveling in that direction or ended up in that direction. That doesn't mean she wouldn't change. Like she's gotten in a wreck now. Things have changed, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Search both ways. Yep. Police initially believed Mara to have been a troubled girl who'd run off to escape her life, even possibly with the intention of suicide. Because of this, the full search for her didn't take place until 36 hours after the accident. So now we've lost precious time. Mm. And yeah, the Murray family arrived and were assisted by dogs, helicopters, and people walking the area nearby and in the woods, but finding no signs of Mara. Search dogs were brought in and followed Mara's trail for about a hundred feet, then lost her scent in the middle of the road. Bill was granted to leave where he was stationed in Oklahoma to help with um, the search for Mara. Unfortunately, the searches found absolutely no signs of Mara And it truly seemed that she had disappeared right into the air. I mean. Mm -hmm. As the investigation into Mara's disappearance continued, information began to circulate about her. Days eventually turned into months and years, but there had been no credible sightings of Mara and nothing of hers had been located. During the first year of the search, a man named Larry Moulton gave Fred a bloody knife that had belonged to his brother, Claude. Claude had a criminal record and lived less than a mile from where the accident had happened in a residence now known as the A-Frame House. Larry believed that it could have been the murder weapon. The knife was also given to the New Hampshire police, but according to Julie, the Murray family never received results of the testing. A few years later, the house changed owners who allowed a search of their home. Cadaver dogs alerted in a closet where a piece of carpet was removed that appeared to have blood on it. The Murray family also reportedly never received these results. In 2017, during the filming of the Oxygen special on Maura Murray, they were able to take a section of wood paneling from the closet and have it tested. While the sample was too degraded to link to Maura, it was found to be DNA evidence from two individuals. Hmm. But we just don't know who. Right. Several days after Maura's disappearance, her dorm room was searched. Police said they found most of her items packed into boxes and things removed from her walls. This statement has been highly debated in the true crime community. Some say that because Mora had recently returned back to school from winter break that she hadn't unpacked. They said that she wasn't allowed to leave her personal belongings in the dorm or allowed to return back to the dorms until January 27th. 
Mora's boyfriend's mother said that she and Mora had joked once about how similar they were, that they both never unpacked, just pulled things out of their bags or suitcases when they needed them. Rather than having packed up her belongings, it's possible she just hadn't unpacked them yet. So, I mean, I do the same thing, honestly. Oh, yeah. Especially if, yeah, if you, if you're going to have to do that anyway, like, forget it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. A few months after the car accident, a man in Haverhill came forward and said that he saw someone fitting Mora's description running about five miles down the road from the accident scene at the intersection of 112 and 116 on the night of her disappearance. Rick Forcier lived across the street from Butch Atwood. When asked why he didn't come forward with this information right after the accident, Forcier said he'd gotten his days mixed up and didn't realize it was the day that they'd been looking for Mora. There are rumors that Forcier told his wife two days after Mora went missing that she'd come to the door that night. He also made a joke that she was living with him and that she was a great cook. Hmm. This guy's a weirdo. Yeah. And like, if you got your days mixed up immediately after the accident, then what's to say you don't have them mixed up now? Yeah, like, definitely. I don't know. Forcier would not allow police to search his residence and they didn't have enough evidence to obtain a search warrant. Forcier was a former New Hampshire state trooper who resigned after making threats against other troopers, even saying that he was going to pull one of their guns in order to force them to shoot him. What is he doing? Yeah, this guy is not well. On the night of Mora's accident, a local woman in Haverhill was walking up to the Swiftwater General Store around 7 to 7.15 p.m., And while she was walking, she noticed a red truck with what appeared to be a Massachusetts license plate pass her, slow down, then completely stop in the middle of the road. As she got closer to the truck, it sped off. When she arrived at the store, the same red truck was sitting in the parking lot. As she neared the store, the truck drove off heading east towards the accident site. And remember, Mora crashed around 7.25 p.m. The woman walked into the store and asked the worker if anyone had come in recently, and they said no. A few minutes later, they heard sirens heading down the road to the accident scene. So was this somebody who was, like, looking for Mora to have left her car and thought, here's a woman walking in the place that we agreed to meet? Yeah, I mean, very well. And slowed down, and then she gets closer, and he's like, no, it's not her. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. Early in the investigation, a rumor began circulating that Mara had been murdered and was buried in a basement nearby. A local contractor had allegedly been doing work on the basement and found what he believed to be bones in the dirt. When he came back to finish the work, the dirt floor had been cemented over. Why? If you find bones in the dirt, I think you need to call the police instead of being like, well, I'm going to head home. I'm going to come back a couple days later. Hope all these bones are still here. Right. Like... Okay. Yeah. Please don't change anything about this. Yeah. And then the people there are like, oh shit, they know. He saw the bones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When the house eventually changed ownership, the new owners agreed to let investigators in. Two cadaver dogs alerted in the basement and ground penetrating radar showed an anomaly in the floor. The concrete was dug up, but the New Hampshire police didn't find anything. Ugh. So much work for not any payoff. Yeah. Right? Crazy. Yeah. So we're going to get into the theories and there are a million, billion, zillion theories, Mm -hmm. but we're just sticking to the ones that are most widely believed. Yeah. So here we go. Mara left intentionally. Could Mara have just decided to leave all by herself that day? Mm -hmm. And not just for a few days, but to start a new life. And many people believe that Mara left UMass that day with the intention of starting a new life. Things weren't perfect in her world and it could have been the reason to seek out a new start. And one of the big issues is that there were many rumors that Bill was cheating on Mara. Supposedly, a girl on the track team at West Point told Mara that she'd had an incident with Bill after Mara had left for UMass. It's also said that just before she left, Mara may have left an email in her room that was from Bill about him cheating on her, along with a West Point sweatshirt and all of the stuffed animals that he'd ever gotten her. Hmm. Bill, however, told the press that his relationship with Mara was great and that they were planning to get married. But a lot of other people said that their relationship was toxic. Friends said that they didn't like how Bill treated her, that he was overbearing and controlling. But Bill actually was indicted in 2019 on one count of felony third degree sexual abuse for a reported attack on a female coworker in D.C. 
there are reported to be at least four other females who have alleged abuse and harassment from Bill, and he could face up to 10 years in prison if convicted. He is still currently awaiting trial. So. Jeez. Yeah. I also wanted to, I guess I'll say it at the end of this, but there are cases of people leaving Mm -hmm. intentionally. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Another thing that could have been weighing on Mara's mind was her concern for disappointing her father. Mm -hmm. After leaving West Point and the recent accident she'd um, had in her father's vehicle, it's believed that Mara was disappointed in herself for disappointing him. So Julie said that Mara was always hard on herself, that she was her worst critic, which I think a lot of us can relate to. Rumors have been spread that Fred pushed his daughters too hard and put too much pressure on them, but Julie adamantly denies that, and there is no proof to corroborate any of that. There have been many posts on message boards reporting sightings of Mara throughout Canada, but none of these sightings have ever been confirmed. A well-known investigative journalist said that he believes Mara left on her own volition or of her own volition that she was running away from the men in her life. And he thinks some of her friends knew about her plan and tried to help her leave. He said he thinks that someone Mara knew made that drive with her in another vehicle and picked her up from the accident scene. The Marie family strongly disagrees with this journalist and his theories. Julie said in a recent video that she made, she addressed many of the theories about her sister's disappearance, and she doesn't believe that her sister disappeared intentionally. Her reasons for ruling this theory are, or ruling this theory out, excuse me, are A, there have been no confirmed sightings of Mara. B, unfortunately, both Mara's mother and oldest sister, Kathleen, passed away after battling cancer. So, Julie does not believe that Mara would know this happened and not be with her family during this time. Mm -hmm. C, she doesn't believe that Mara had the resources required to disappear without a trace. And then D, Julie said that she knew Mara better than anyone else and this would be completely out of character for her. Yeah, I mean, I understand that. I mean, if like, you know, we are obviously sisters. And if you just up and disappeared one day, I would be like, I would think the same thing. No. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who do kind of disappear for a few days, weeks, whatever. And like, it is possible. But, you know, for us, I feel like both of us would be like, no, that absolutely wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. But you also, I don't know. There's just, anything's possible. Yeah, and you... I think even if you know somebody and you think you know them so well, there are things sometimes that people just don't share. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, especially if they're going through a really dark time or I don't know what happened, obviously. Nobody does. But if she has an intention of leaving without a trace, you can't tell anybody. Otherwise, somebody's going to know, you know, like. Yeah. I don't know, though. Yeah. So. For some reason, like when, you know, we were getting ready to do this case, an episode of Disappeared kept popping into my mind, and it was the case of Michelle McMullen. And I think it was like season one of Disappeared, but she had been living in, I believe it was Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and she had been accused of stealing $20,000 from the church that she worked at and then used the money to pay for school tuition. Mm -hmm. And they said it was likely that she never would have gone to prison. Mm -hmm. But she had a six-year-old son. And she ended up, like, going and dropping her son off at her parents' house and then just leaving. Mm. And so her family thought that something had happened to her, right? Because, like, she's got a kid. She was in school. And also they were like, you know, yeah, she was embarrassed about getting, you know, caught for like the forgery and stealing the money or whatever, but she wasn't, it wasn't like she was going to go to jail for 30 years, you know? So Mm -hmm. they were like, that's not big enough for her to leave her whole life, right? Right. Well, she ended up going um, somewhere else. I don't remember exactly where. And she worked at this like hotel and she had told people that, She went by the name Monique Watson. She said that she was a Hurricane Katrina victim who had lost everything and was running from a stranger who had held her captive in a home, raping her repeatedly. Wow. And she kind of went, like, all over the place. In California, they knew her as Danielle Jones, the adopted daughter of abusive parents who left her Chicago home with no money or identification. And, like, the people that she worked with, 
believed her. They felt really sorry for her. But she spent three years as someone else. And she said that she like just legitimately thought that she was doing everybody a favor, you know, that she was so ashamed and whatever. But like the people that knew her for those three years or whatever said that she never once mentioned ever having a child. Mm. And, you know, her family didn't think she would ever leave her child behind. So I say that just to say, like, it is possible that people like that we might look at something and be like, well, that's not that big of a deal. Right. But that somebody else might, you know, take on all the shame and and just feel a different way about it and feel like they want to disappear. I, I do still think, though, that that would take a ton of work. But I mean, this girl, Michelle McMullen, I mean, she made it work for a few years. But again, she only made it work for a few years. So yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I don't either. But I mean, that's a very good story or um, case to discuss when we're discussing something like this. I mean, it can happen. Mm -hmm. So the second theory is that Mara left with the intention of harming herself. And, you know, people have been wondering, like, is it possible that Mara left UMass that afternoon with the intention of driving to an area that she was comfortable with, where her family, she and her family used to hike, with thoughts of suicide. And it wasn't a secret to her family that Mara was struggling. She suffered from an eating disorder and had a difficult time cutting herself any slack. Mm -hmm. So Julie doesn't believe this is logical though. And these are her reasons. Mara submitted her homework the night before. To her, this doesn't make sense if Mara planned on hurting herself. Mara obtained the accident forms before leaving UMass. She obviously packed a bag and took items with her as if she were planning on being out of town for a few days. And there were no footprints in the snow around Mara's car. So if she'd walked into the woods, there would be evidence of that. Plus, Mara's remains have never been found. Yeah. I think they would have found her remains if she had killed herself. Yeah, absolutely. Especially out there. Like, there's Mm -hmm. been so many searches. Uh, Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the third theory that we're going to talk about is Mara met with foul play. Many believed that Mara left UMass that Monday with the intention of taking a break. She packed some belongings and taken t- care of a few errands before leaving, grabbed money and alcohol for the trip, and was headed towards the areas that she was familiar with, where she and her family had spent a lot of time. So Fred believes that Mara was very upset about something, though he's not sure what. He said that he could see her driving to an old camping spot in Bartlett, New Hampshire, near the edge of the White Mountains and the border of Maine. The spot was just about an hour and a half hours east of where she crashed. And he said that being in that spot would have given her solace. Both he and Julie think that something derailed her plan that night and that Mara was abducted and murdered. Julie reasoned that because there haven't been any confirmed sightings of her sister or evidence of remains, that there hasn't been any bank or cell phone activity. And she thinks that Mara was met with foul play that night, possibly having trusted the wrong person to help her. So she said that during their last phone conversation, Mara was excited talking about an upcoming trip that she, Julie, and one of her UMass friends were talking about. They were going to Myrtle Beach on spring break. And nothing seemed off that would indicate that Mara planned on leaving for good or harming herself. She, But she did also withdraw basically all the money from her bank account. And if she was just going like on a trip to stay in a cabin or something, don't you think she would like, I mean, you can use a credit card pretty much everywhere. Mm Mm-hmm. So why would you take out all the money in your bank account? Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea. Now, I'm not at all trying to be disrespectful to the family because they can 100% have their theories and what they believe. And I'm not saying anything about that. My thought, and I said this in the first episode, was my first, not my first thought, but I'm just, again, trying to play devil's advocate because that's what we're talking about. But Yes, she did complete her assignments. Yes, she did run the errands. Yes, she did pack a bag. But that could have easily been just a decoy for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I'm coming back. I'm totally coming back to buy her some time and get maybe people off of her case if she was trying to leave. Right. Yeah. You don't want to throw up any red flags if you're, if that's your plan. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm just right. saying it, it could. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't know what happened, so. Yeah. Can't rule it out. Exactly. 
Okay, so there are many, many more theories as to what happened to Mara that evening, but none of them can be proven. And it seems that finding the answer to one question may lead to the answers to where Mara is. But the thing is, where was she driving to that day? <laughs> so Fred has a bunch of Mara's belongings and handmade things that he saved. He loves to talk about her. He lights up when he's telling stories about her. There are a lot of people in the true crime community who believe that the Murray family know more than what they've told the police or the press, but there is just no proof of that. In the Oxygen special about Mara, Fred said that he wished he knew what she was or what was going through his daughter's head. He said, quote, I just wish I could sit down and talk with Mara just for a, a short time. I wouldn't even have to say anything. If she came up the stairs, neither one of us would need to say anything. That's so heartbreaking. I know. And I mean, he still like every weekend goes and looks for her. Mm -hmm. He misses her so much. It's just so tragic. Yeah. In September of 2021, bone fragments were found on a construction site in Loon Mountain, about 25 miles east of where Mara crashed her vehicle. These bones were processed and radiocarbon dating was used to determine that the bones belonged to someone who likely died between 1774 and 1942. So there was no way. That's a long as fuck gap, by the way. Yeah, it's like sometime 500 BC to 1992. (laughs) Like in the span of 2,000 years. I know, right? It's ridiculous. Yeah. But I mean, what the hell do I know? But it couldn't have been Mara. But this, of course, briefly renewed hope for the Murray family that they might have some answers and be able to lay her to rest. But it just didn't have anything to do with her, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. In early of 2022, the FBI released a new bulletin about Mara's disappearance which will increase the search for her nationwide. Though the Murray family thinks this should have been done a lot earlier, they are happy that the search is finally being expanded. Unfortunately, Lori, Mara's mother, passed away in 2009 after a long battle with cancer. And then five years after Mara disappeared on what would have been her daughter's 27th birthday. I can't believe she passed away on her daughter's 27th. Like, that's so sad. Uh, Yeah. What a hard day for the Mm -hmm. remaining members of the family. Kathleen, Mara's older sister, also passed away after battling cancer in November of 2021. The rest of the Murray family is extremely active in searching for Mara. As of March 2022, Mara has been missing for 18 years. And please visit the Murray family's official website for more information or follow Julie's TikTok page. And that is at Mara Murray Missing to see videos and learn more about Mara. And be aware that there is significant a significant amount of information online about this case, much of it being false and rumors. And if you have any information about Mara's disappearance, please contact the Murray family directly or contact the New Hampshire police, state police. Yes. Now, we mentioned a case earlier that had some similarities to it where somebody chose to disappear. But there are also cases that are similar that are foul play. So... While Mora's story has fortunately been heavily publicized and garnered a substantial amount of armchair detectors who keep her case alive, there are other cases- armchair detectors. Did I? Yes, you did. I don't even know what an armchair detector is. I don't either. Is it battery <laughs> powered? Is it, do you plug it in? I don't know what to do with it. Well, how do you have to change? Do you have to change the batteries a lot or is it going to start beeping? Yeah, it's going like to chirp. a smoke detector. Yeah, yeah. it's going to chirp for sure. Yeah. And then everybody's just going to not get any sleep. Right. Those armchair Although, detectors. <laughs> I used to live next to this house and I heard the chirping from their house all the time. And I was like, oh do my they gosh. not hear it? That's crazy. Replace the batteries. I know. Yeah. It drove me crazy and I didn't even live there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> so the case of Leah Roberts bears a striking resemblance to Mora's disappearance. I cannot talk today. Leah Roberts was 23 years old when she disappeared, leaving her Jeep wrecked in a rural area with no sign of her to be found. Leah Toby Roberts was born on June 23, 1976 in Durham, North Carolina. Leah had a difficult time growing up. At 17, when she was a senior in high school, her father was diagnosed with a serious respiratory disease. At 21, while Leah was a sophomore in college at North Carolina State University, her mother suddenly died from heart disease. Having dealt with so much at such a young age, Leah was determined to experience everything that life had to offer. Her older sister, Kara, said that Leah wanted to spread her wings and see the world. She loved writing and often spent her days at a local coffee shop, writing in her journals and reading. Her older brother, Heath, called his sister an old soul, philosophical and wise beyond her years. 
After her mother's death, Leah took some time off school, spending much of her time writing and feeling like she'd been born again into a new life without a mother. She returned to school in the fall of 1998. Shortly after, Leah was driving when a large truck turned in front of her, and she had no choice but to hit the truck. Among other injuries, Leah suffered a punctured lung and shattered femur. Goodness. She had to have surgery to place a metal rod in her leg. Mm. Leah told her sister that she remembered feeling like she was going to die just before the impact and that she was going to start living her life to the fullest. She studied abroad for a semester in Spain and enlisted in a field study program in Costa Rica. Three weeks before Leah was to leave for Costa Rica, her father passed away. I just feel so bad for this family. I know. She couldn't decide whether to continue on her study or cancel her trip, and uh, ultimately she decided to continue with her trip, and she spent the summer of 1999 in Costa Rica. Leah's roommate, Nicole, went to visit her in Costa Rica and remembered how worried she was about Leah. She said her friend didn't seem to be dealing with the fact that her father had just died. She said that Leah was soaking in everything that Costa Rica had to offer and making the most of her time there. When she returned to North Carolina, Leah's friends began to notice a significant change in her behavior. She started withdrawing from her friends and spent most of her time at the coffee shop. She was there working on her computer. She met people who got her thinking about a life outside of Raleigh. She began taking guitar lessons, photography lessons, and spent hours writing in her journals. Nicole said Leah would often go out by herself and meet people. She was pulling away from everybody in her life. Heath believed that Leah was rejecting that she had to live a life like everyone else. She dropped out of school with only one semester left to earn a degree in anthropology and Spanish. Heath tried to encourage her to stick it out for the last semester, but she didn't want to. On the morning of March 9th, 2000, Kara called Leah. The two spoke often and were close as Kara was only two years older. She said that the conversation was ordinary and she didn't notice anything strange about Leah. Around 11 a.m., Leah confirmed plans for the next day to babysit with Nicole. Friday came and Leah never showed up to babysit. Nicole assumed that Leah had either forgotten or something else had come up. When she got back home, Leah wasn't there. Nicole said it wasn't abnormal for them to not see each other for a day or two since they had different schedules, so she wasn't too concerned. Two days passed and there had been no sign of Leah or her car. Nicole began getting phone calls from other friends who said that Leah had missed plans and they weren't able to find her. On Sunday, March 12th, Nicole called Kara to ask if she'd seen or heard from her sister. Neither Kara or Heath knew where she was. The three of them started calling everyone they knew, but no one knew where Leah was. The following day, Kara met Nicole at their house to try to figure things out. When Kara went into her sister's room, she could see that Leah likely left voluntarily. It appeared that she'd packed bags with belongings and taken her cat, B with her. Nothing indicated that there'd been a fight or a struggle. Her old white Jeep Cherokee was also missing from the driveway. Kara was seriously concerned about her sister's mental state, so she and Nicole went to the Raleigh Police Department on March 13th to file a missing persons report, but unfortunately there wasn't much they could do. No one had any idea where to even start searching for her. On the 14th, Kara went back to Leah's room to search again and see if she'd overlooked anything. She found a folded up piece of paper with a drawing of the Cheshire Cat smile on the front. Despite knowing that Leah was a big fan of Alice in Wonderland, it was an eerie drawing. The Cheshire Cat just is eerie. But anyway. yeah, yeah. Kara knew that the Cheshire Cat was the character that would disappear and reappear out of nowhere. She thought this was intended to tell her that Leah was gone, but she'd be back soon. Inside of the note was a stack of cash to cover her part of the bills. Kara said it was about enough to cover a month of bills. The inside of the note said that she wasn't suicidal. She was the exact opposite. It also said, remember, everyone is together in thoughts and prayers and time passes quickly. Have faith in yourself. She mentioned, remember Jack Kerouac. Leah loved the author Jack Kerouac and romanticized his writings about traveling the country and finding himself. Leah once mentioned to Nicole that they should take a spontaneous trip to California. Nicole said she'd love to, but she had school and work and she couldn't just pack up and leave. But Leah could. She had no responsibilities and had a small amount of money left to her from her parents. When Leah had traveled to Costa Rica, Kara had been put as her power of attorney since Leah was leaving the country. This enabled Kara to be able to look at Leah's bank accounts. Having no clue where her sister was, Kara checked the activity on her bank account. 
she could see that based on her transactions, she was headed west on I-40. She believed that Leah left on the evening they'd last spoken on March 9th. She'd gone to the bank and withdrawn $3,000 from her checking account. Leah had checked into a hotel near Memphis on March 10th. After that, she only used her debit card for gas. The last transaction on her debit card was March 13th at 1257 a.m. at a gas station in Brooks, Oregon. Back in Raleigh, Nicole coll- connected with one of Leah's new friends at the coffee shop, Janine Quiller. Janine said that she and Leah had bonded over their love for Jack Kerouac. In one of his books called The Dharma Bums, Kerouac wrote about going to Washington State Mountain to figure out what was important to him. Janine said that this really resonated with Leah and she wanted to do that. She said that Leah wasn't sad or depressed, she was just yearning for answers. Janine knew that Leah would leave eventually. On March 19th, this was Kara's birthday and she expected to hear from Leah. Instead, she received a note on her door to contact the local sheriff's department. When she did, they informed her that Leah's Jeep had been found down an embankment near Bellingham, Washington. On the 18th, a man and his wife were walking up the Canyon Creek Road in Mount Baker National Forest when they noticed clothes in the trees. When they looked down the ravine, they saw a white Jeep Cherokee with a new North Carolina license plate. They called 911 and police were able to find a passport and ID and connect the vehicle to Leah. Police said this wasn't too abnormal. People often crash their vehicle while driving drunk and then abandon their car to walk. They did find it odd that the car was from North Carolina, though. I mean, this is like super far away. Yeah. The car had significant damage and appeared to have rolled. There were blankets and pillows covering the blown out windows that seemed to have been intentionally placed there. Belongings were scattered throughout the car in the nearby area, including Leah's checkbook, clothing, and guitar. There was no obvious signs that someone had been injured in the vehicle. There was no blood, no evidence of damage from a person to the steering wheel or windshield. Kara and Heath arrived in Bellingham on March 21st and tried to trace Leah's last whereabouts. Bellingham was a charming small town surrounded by wilderness, and they felt confident that she would have been seen by a local. They checked with local hospitals, but none had any records of Leah or a Jane Doe matching her description. As police sifted through the belongings at the crash scene inside of a memory box, they found a movie ticket stub for American Beauty at the Ellis Fair Mall in Bellingham. Figuring in the time it would have taken her to drive from the gas station in Oregon to Bellingham to the time of the movie, it would have given Leah a few hours in the city before the movie. Kara and Heath created a missing persons flyer and began distributing it around the city. Nobody in the movie theater recognized her picture, so Kara and Heath went to the mall's food court. Kara noticed a restaurant that seemed like the type of place Leah would go to. A staff member did recognize Leah's photo and said that they remembered her sitting at the bar alone. The next day, one of the patrons who'd been sitting next to Leah at the bar called in a tip to the police. He described her as warm and willing to share information about her life. A man who'd been sitting on the other side of Leah was contacted by police. He said that he'd spoken with Leah and she talked to him about Jack Kerouac. He also said that she didn't leave the restaurant alone. He gave police a very detailed description of a man named Barry. The second man's story did not match the initial witness's story, and police think the detailed description could have been a ruse. Leah's car was towed to a secure facility and processed. Twelve days after her Jeep had been found, police discovered a pair of pants in the vehicle with about $2,400 cash in the pockets. It didn't appear that she'd used much of that cash since Oregon. The most concerning thing was the ring they found on the front passenger's floor. It was Leah's mother's ring, and her friend said she never took it off. There was no reason they could think that she would have left without it. Within two weeks of the car being located, search and rescue dogs were brought to the area along with helicopters to search from the air. They looked above and below the area the car was found, even down to the river, but they found no signs of Leah. Police began to wonder if anyone had even been in the vehicle when it crashed. They contacted the gas station in Oregon to obtain surveillance video footage of Leah. It showed her going into the store, paying for her gas, and peering out of the window of the gas station. And it, you know, they don't know what she was looking at. She may have just been looking at like, oh, what pump number was it, you know, that I needed to Mm -hmm. put gas on. There were no cameras outside, so it's unclear what Leah was looking at. She appeared fine, and there was no sign to indicate that she was traveling with someone. Police continued to question the second man at the bar. He said he'd never seen Leah after that day, but something about his behavior struck police as odd. With no further leads and no signs of Leah, her case began to go cold. 
Police asked Kara what she'd like to do with Leah's car, but she was adamant that they keep the car secure in case something changed and they were able to find something new in the future. So why did they ask her? I guess they were just going to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. But they're like, well, okay. I guess like, they had to do something with it, but they're like, hey, you need to keep it though. Yeah. Like, it's an open case. And just tell them that. Yeah. Just tell her that. But like, keep the car. It's an open case. Yeah. Yeah. In December of 2006, the detective who'd been in charge of Leah's case retired and a new one took over. He wanted to re-examine the evidence in her case and realized that no one had ever opened the hood of the Jeep when it was being processed. From what they found, it appeared that no one was in the car when it crashed. In addition to the original findings of no blood or evidence that anyone had been injured in the car, as well as the fact that it didn't appear that the seatbelt had been used, they also found the cover to the starter relay had been removed. They knew the vehicle had to have been traveling at a moderate rate of speed to cause the damage that had been found to the surrounding trees, and this explained it. It made it possible for someone to turn the key of the vehicle, push the starter relay, and the Jeep could have accelerated on its own. It definitely appeared to have been tampered with, most likely by someone with a good knowledge of cars. Like Torella. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they don't talk about the phalange, but those are... You got to really know your stuff about cars to get to the phalange, you know what I mean? Of course you, yeah. Yeah. Still in Leah's case file, detectives noticed that the second man from the bar had experience from being a mechanic and in the military. Police continued to reprocess the Jeep and found a series of fingerprints on the inner underside of the hood that hadn't been documented in the first investigation. With something to now compare them to, police found the second man now living in Canada. They requested from Canada um, or for Canada police to obtain fingerprints and DNA from the man. They went over all of the clothing found in Leah's car to look for DNA. And in the spring of 2010, they found male DNA on an item in the car. It took two years for police to get DNA and fingerprints from the second man in Canada, and it was not a match. Though Leah has been missing for 22 years, police feel confident that they'll find her one day. Heath and Kara remain hopeful that they'll get some sort of closure and find out what happened to Leah when she left Oregon. Though Mora and Leah's cases are not suspected to be connected in any way, it's obvious that there are cases spanning the world of women who disappear without a, a trace. Similarly to Mora's case, there is much speculation as to why Leah left, why she didn't tell anyone, and what happened to her. It seems likely that perhaps similar to Mara, Leah left on her own, but then her plans were derailed and she met with foul play. Regardless of what happened, the most important thing is to spread the word about the victims in these cases and make sure that people do not stop looking for answers. Mm -hmm. (sighs) You know how I feel about unsolved cases. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, it's just, again, like you can't rule anything out because we just don't know. Right. So, I mean, is it likely that, you know, what are the odds that she crashes her car and then somebody who has nefarious intentions comes across her? I mean, it's unlikely, but but it it happens. happens. Yeah. I mean, everybody who's ever come across a serial killer has been in that, you know, percentage of like, well, shit, I ran into a serial killer. (laughs) Like, right. You know, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's it. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, Same thing with anything, really, you know, like what's the likelihood that you're going to get in a car accident? I mean, hopefully not very much, but it happens like Mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff happens. So, yeah, there's just I don't know. I just wish we knew more. I it makes me so upset to not. The thing is, okay. so my thing with Mara and I I believe like with Leah's case obviously something bad happened to her. Like, I don't think that she just disappeared herself. And I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. But with Mara's case, if she did, if she just decided to pick up and start anew, it would make me sad for her. I understand the family 100% wants to know where she is and just wants to maybe know that she's safe, if anything. But it would make me sad that so many people are trying so hard to find her if she just wants to be left alone. Mm -hmm. because that's going against her wishes. But at the same time, we don't know enough to know that. So what if she, what if something happened to her? Like it just, it's infuriating. And I see why people are so intrigued by it and want to talk about it so much, but it's just so, it's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, you know, like we said, there are tons of other podcasts out there. I mean, there's, um, I don't remember the name of it, but there's one that's like, 
only dedicated to this mm-hmm. case. Um, yes. And it's got like multiple seasons, I think. So there's definitely other info that you can get on it. Um, but we tried to keep it to, there's not a ton of facts known. I mean, I feel like no. we said so many times, it's unclear, it's unclear, it's unclear. But I think it's just like the, what people, the most common things heard yeah. about the case. Yeah, because there are things that are, I mean, just straight like, we try to stay away from like rumors, especially things that have been proven to be false, but. Yeah, like the pregnancy rumor. Yeah. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Well, that's it. That's it, guys. Yeah. Definitely um, let us know what you think happened. I'm interested absolutely. to hear the other theories. Yes, absolutely. And thank you guys so much for listening. We love you and we will catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Connect with us on Instagram or Facebook to continue the conversation. Thanks for listening and we will meet you back here next week. Bye. The theme song for the show is created and composed by Stephen Toby. You can find more of Stephen's work on SoundCloud. Our logo was created by Sloan Williams of Sophisticated Crayon. You can find more of her work on Etsy. Visit us at killerqueenspodcast.com for merch and other info about the show. 